Dr. David Capes is a New Testament scholar and is the professor of Christianity at uh, Houston Baptist University. But I've also discovered he's also the professor of Greek and New Testament. So we have two for the price of one this evening. He's guided us in these past evenings with brilliant insights into the nature of Christ as Lord and also blessed us today with his message in the chapel about imitating Jesus Christ. I'd like to welcome him this evening to conclude his series of three talks. It's been very good to have you with us. We've heard much of your family and your uh, grandson, Toby, but we're looking forward this evening to hearing more from you. Following this evening uh, lecture, there'll be a time of uh, short questions, which I'll uh, oversee. Then I'm going to call upon our president, Dr. Harry Gardner, to formally conclude the 2014 Hayward Lecture Series. Dr. David Capes. It's great to be back with you here for this final night. Uh, these days have flown by very quickly. I have enjoyed so much the accommodations, the hospitality, the conversations, the good food, the laughs, the jokes, the, um, just the, the gifts. It's been amazing. And I want to thank you for uh, spending this evening with us uh, after a very tragic day um, that I think all of our minds, unfortunately, will be dwelling on as we probably put our heads on our pillows tonight thinking about the events of the day. So our prayers are with these good people who've suffered so badly, who, um, and, and, and those who, who now bear the burden of how do we carry on after that. So our prayers are with this great, with this great nation. Um, how to finish up. I've got, uh, I've got some time this evening with you, and I want to spend that time digging in a few texts. And I hope, that, I hope that we will be able to focus our attention. I started on the first evening with sort of a broad categories of, of language and such from the Hebrew scriptures and the Greek New Testament about the Lordship of Jesus. We, we've looked at some of the context in which Paul was prone to use that language and why it was and how he wants us to think of when, when, when we think of Christ, as the church thinks of Christ, is the same way as when a Jew thought about Yahweh. So to some degree, it's Christ is to the bride, his bride, the church, as Yahweh is to Israel. And I think those are some images um, and some ideas that I think we can explore tonight in the time that we have um, uh, together. I was going to show you a picture of Toby, but I decided against it. hope that's all right, my son. But I've got a great picture. I'll show you after if you want just ask me. In, uh, in Paul and the Faithfulness of God, N.T. Wright remarks that he, it has become commonplace, his quote, for scholars to point out that Paul regularly referred to Jesus using scriptural quotations where the Greek word kyrios translates the tetragrammaton. Exactly how and when this became commonplace, he does not say, but I think I can take at least a little bit of the credit with the monograph that I wrote a few years back called Old Testament Yahweh Text in Paul's Christology. Many years ago, in a graduate seminar on Paul, my doctor father, E. Earl Ellis, pointed out a feature of Paul's letters, namely his tendency to quote what I later termed Yahweh Text and apply them to Jesus. This struck me at the time and continues to strike me as a remarkable exegetical move made by a self-consciously Jewish follower of Jesus. Given the kind of reverence accorded to the divine name, we'll see some evidence of that tonight, and given the apostles' high regard for scripture, I was astonished that so few scholars had really taken time to investigate it at the time. Now, a Yahweh text is a quotation of and this is the way I use the term, I'm actually not sure where that term came from. I, I, Craig may know, but I, I've tried to go through my mind. I don't think I invented it. I think somebody else did. I just stole it. Is that okay to say? So if I stole it, 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 as I use it, it means a quotation of or an allusion to an Old Testament text that refers directly to the divine name. It contains the divine name. And since Paul is writing to churches in Greek, the focus of my talk this evening will be Old Testament quotations and allusions containing the kurios predicate in which kurios translates 
the divine name. Now, there are some places, a few places, three, I think, where the word kurios doesn't translate the divine name. It translates the word Adonai. I'm leaving that aside for this time. So this lecture will argue that Paul consciously and unambiguously applies to Jesus these sacred words and text originally about Yahweh, the unspeakable name of God. It will consider furthermore how it is that Paul, Jesus, Paul is able to clue Jesus within this, the name of God. And I think this practice, exegetical practice, along with other patterns of religious devotion, points to the reality of a high Christology in the first extant documents of the Christian movement. Now, there's a good question to ask as we begin. What kind of text would Paul have been working from? What would Paul have seen in biblical text and 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 other kinds of texts that he, that he might might to have. Now, let me uh, let me give you a few examples here from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Here is eleven Q Psalms, and you'll notice I have it's it's, an, it's a Hebrew text, and I have circled for you in red the the name of God, the unspeakable name of God, the Tetragrammaton, the Yod, the Hey, the Vav, the Hey, as it's written in Paleo Hebrew. So you have an Arab, yet you have a, a a square script, as it's sometimes called. And then when you come to the divine name, it's written in this more archaic. It's sort of like typing along in Times Roman, and then when you come to God's name, you switch into Gothic, right? Something dramatic, something thick, something unusual. And those, for those who are sort of trained and can see it, those have a tendency to stick out. Here's another example, and I am I'm sorry, this did not... Uh, it was clearer uh, earlier, and for some reason, I guess when I copied it over into the text, it, it didn't uh, copy very well. Uh, the, the famous Isaiah scroll, 1Q Isaiah, you'll see I've circled there. This is, uh, would be roughly 6513 in the book of Isaiah. The Tetragrammaton is written in square script, just regular square script, yod Hey vav Hey, And right above that is written in, in Hebrew, Adonai, which would be the one of the acceptable surrogate words that you could speak uh, when you came to that. So that's another uh, kind of example. Here's, here's, here, these are uh, several of one of my favorite ways in which here is the uh, manual discipline, 1Q, uh, S, Sirach HaYahad, uh, the rule of the community. And you'll, unfortunately, I didn't circle this, but you can see right in the center of the page, four dots. That's the divine name. Rather than writing it out, yod hey vav hey, rather than writing it in Paleo Hebrew, it's four dots, four letters, so four dots. And that happens in a number of places. I'll show you. Here's another example, 4Q Testimonia. I think it's 175, but later described as 4Q Testimonia. Four dots right here. Testimony is not exactly a biblical text. It's usually a collection of biblical text under a certain theme, I guess we could say. But here again, the Tetragrammaton, the unspeakable name of God, written as four dots. Here's another example from 1Q Isaiah. Uh, it's, it's that third or fourth line up there. It's actually written between the line, but I think you can see the four dots. Hopefully you can see the four dots written quite uh, right in between the two lines there, but that would be the divine name as well. Now here is a little bit different. This is a Greek text from uh, most of the documents discovered among the Dead Sea Scrolls written in Hebrew, but there are a few written in Greek, and this is a, a Greek version of Leviticus. It's hard to see, but what I've circled there, you see it's a Greek text, and they've taken the name of God, and they've written it as, as three Greek letters, Yoda, Alpha, Omega. Yoda, Alpha Omega. Notice over here, I've given it to you, but in, in our script, the uppercase Omega is, is written that way. Uh, the Omega they wrote was like the letter W, kind of a big fat W. And, that's, and part of that has been eroded away, but that would be the divine name written, and it would be pronounced something like Yaho or something, Yaho. Uh, and close to Yahweh, not exactly. But we have evidence of this kind of representing the divine name back as far as the 5th century B.C. In Greek text, the divine name, Yao, that way. found that kind of fascinating. And then, uh, this is a Greek text as well, from the Hall Hever, uh, in the Dead Sea area. This is uh, part of the 
the scrolls of uh, the minor prophets, and you'll see in a Greek text the divine name written in Paleo Hebrew. Right? This is this might have been something that Paul might have encountered. John the Baptist might have encountered. Uh, writing in Greek text, and yet the divine name represented here in Paleo Hebrew. Here's another example. Uh, this is uh, the uh, Fuad Papyri 266. I've tried to point our ways to them. A couple of things I want you to notice about this is that it is a, a Greek text, and Yahweh is written as yod He vav He in Aramaic script uh, in these particular places. So it's, it's a regular square script in a Greek text. And um, the other thing I'd like for you to notice is the space allotted around it. It's as if... And, it's as if the, the, the Greek scribe is writing away in Greek. When he gets to the divine name, though, he leaves it blank. And he skips a space so that somebody else can come in later and write the name of God, the Yod, the He, the Vav, the He, and write it in Aramaic. Um, we see that. We see spaces sometimes around the divine name. And, and we want to say more about that perhaps in a moment. Here's another example. This is harder to see, and I'm, I'm sorry I didn't uh, circle it, but it's uh, from the bottom, uh, right up underneath my, where my finger is, going up on the fourth line there, we have a Greek text, again, in which the divine name is written in a Paleo-Hebrew kind of character. Okay? So those are just some examples of the kinds of things that, and these roughly are occurring at the time of Paul and Jesus in the early church. Some of them will, will be earlier, but some of them will be be, uh, be, be, be later, perhaps, as well. Um, now, let me, let me try to summarize what we have here. We have the state of the text. In Hebrew text, we have Yahweh written in Aramaic script, probably the most common. We have Yahweh written in Paleo-Hebrew script. And then we have Yahweh represented by four dots, dot, 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 dot. And Yahweh written in Aramaic script, but glossed or commented on as Adonai. A, a suitable surrogate sub substitute for the name. In Greek text, it's a little more complicated. We have Yahweh written in a Greek text in an Aramaic script, Aramaic or the square script. Yahweh written in Paleo Hebrew. And then we didn't, I didn't show you an example of this, but in a few cases, the, Yahweh is written as Pippi in Greek. Pi Iota, Pi Iota. Now the reason for that is because it looks like the Yod, the Hay, the Vav, the Hay. Right? So, if, and I've given you the, the square script on the other side so you can compare what they look like. In Greek, that would be pronounced pippi. Pi iota, pi iota, pippi. Or something to that effect. But I think it, because it has a similar look, it was written in that particular way. And then we have Yahweh transliterated as yao, yao, uh, where that final omega is really a rounded W look in what, what, most of us learned in Greek probably as a lowercase, but just a big version of it. And then later we see Yahweh translated or written as Kyrios. And um, we'll, we'll want to comment upon that in just a minute. Well, let me give you some other uh, sort of evidence that comes from this particular period. And uh, a few ideas about the writing of the scrolls and such. Jonathan Siegel makes the case that the special treatment in writing the Tetragrammaton originated actually in the circumvention of pronunciation. Consider 4Q134, a biblical paraphrase, also known as 4Q158. Or no, so compare that to 1Q58. In this document, Yahweh is written in square characters, but always preceded by two thick black dots, written like a semicolon. John Strugnell explains that this was a warning to the reader not to pronounce the next word, the name it is written, but to use a substitute word. According to Siegel, and I think he's probably correct, a distinction in writing has its basis in a distinction in pronunciation. What was too sacred to pronounce was also too sacred to be written normally. According to 11Q, uh, about 11Q Psalms, rather, Shemar Yahu Talmon, makes the observation that it's the case that the Paleo-Hebrew Tetragrammata, it's a 
Hebrew text, but Paleo-Hebrew, there's 143 instances of it, are written only after the text has been written in square letters, not during actually the course of writing. So they, again, they wrote the text. When they came to the, the divine name, the first scribe would skip over a space and then continue writing, but someone else would come back, perhaps a senior scholar, would come back in later and write in a Paleo-Hebrew text uh, the, the divine name. No other divine name is treated that way. Manuscript erasures also I found to be interesting as well. There are 28 erasures in 11 Q Psalms A. So apparently the scribe had no qualms about erasing mistakes. But in two cases, the tetragrammaton is written superfluously. It doesn't belong there in Paleo-Hebrew. These were not erased. Each time they had dots circling them, some above, some below, as it were to cancel out the reading. We call those cancellation dots. Whatever was surrounded by dots was not to be read. Given uh, Once a divine name apparently had been written down, it was written and could not be eroded, brought, blotted out or erased. Centuries later in the Jerusalem Talmud, it takes up the problem. What to do if a scribe makes a mistake in writing the divine name? Rabbis debated about what to do. Does that include the suffixes? Does that include the pronouns uh, associated with it? Does that include the prepositions on the front end in some cases? And the debate suggests that there was no resolution, no agreement on how these instances should be handled. But it seems that once the name was written, it was to be written and something else was to be done. In some cases, they recommend just throwing the whole page away and uh, starting over again. Now, a number of scholars have tried to sort of sort this out. P.W. Ski, and some of you let me know his work, um, tries to give some kind of chronology. And he is followed by Martin Hingle and some others as well. And I think he's got a fairly good case. He says, in the earliest Greek manuscripts, the Tetragrammaton is probably the one that's transliterated. That seems to be the earliest thing. So when you come to the name, you write it Iota, Alpha, Omega. And then the second level was that Yahweh is written in an Aramaic script in a Greek text. And then Yahweh is written in Paleo-Hebrew in a Greek text. And finally, Yahweh is rendered as kurios in the Greek text. Now his argument, and Petersma and others are going to say, and I'll read that in a moment, is that actually you have kind of an archaization. You have a going back to. You, you have a tendency because of all the, the trouble with Hellenization and, and such, uh, that, that they wanted to kind of go back to the sources. They wanted to go back and uh, reclaim a bit of their heritage. So Albert Petersma building on these other analyses, describes this archaizing process in the writing of the divine name at places like Qumran. This seems to coincide with reactions against the encroaching Hellenism. He writes, the Paleo-Hebrew tetragram in Greek witnesses is not the oldest, but apparently the youngest. We'd think it'd be the oldest because it's Paleo, right? No, he it says it's the youngest. Both in the Hebrew manuscripts from Qumran in our earliest Greek manuscripts, there is clear evidence the divine name is the result of some sort of revisionary activity. So let's venture towards some conclusions in regard to this. The examples we cite, and there are others, there could be many others, indicate there's no one way the divine name was written in Greek and Hebrew biblical text around the time of Paul. This would include entire scrolls held in synagogue collections or excerpts like testimonia used for polemical, liturgical, or devotional purposes. What is evident, however, is that the divine name, and in some cases the spaces in the letters around the divine name, are treated differently with great reverence. And the archaizing tendency to write the name in Paleo-Hebrew provides early material evidence for the reverence being accorded to the divine name. And there are other examples of it, too. We find it um, uh, in, in, in other, in other texts. But now, let me, uh, let me venture toward a kind of a, a, a reading of what, what I really want to focus in upon this evening. I want to look at this whole phenomenon of Yahweh text in Paul's letters. In the undisputed letters, the apostle quotes Yahweh text a number of times, sometimes with God as reference, sometimes with Christ. And this is the kind of the chart that I have developed. 
And we talked a little bit about this last night. When Paul quotes the Yahweh text, it's all, not always the case that he refers them to Christ. In some cases, it's fairly clear that he wants us to think of God the Father as the one there. And there are reasons for that, and I provide some evidence for that. But these are the ones right here. And these are the ones on this side that describe Yahweh text where Christ seems to be referred to. Now, some of those are controversial. Uh, some of those are not. The next slide is allusions to Yahweh text. These are, in, in one case, you have quotations from, and, and often those are pre prefaced with an introductory formula, ge grapti gar, for it has been written, or as the prophet says, something like that. Those are, those are very often the case, but not always in those. But there are also allusions to Yahweh text in which Christ is the referent. And here are three, 2 Corinthians 3, 16, Philippians 2, one of the more famous, and then finally 1 Thessalonians 3. Again, more elusive use. It's now, as far as I can tell, there are no elusive uses of Yahweh with God the Father as referent. Whether a passage refers to God or Christ cannot be assumed simply based upon the presence or absence of the word kurios. Each one had to be, has to be worked out through a careful contextual and exegetical analysis. The simple assumption made by some earlier scholars that Kurios in Paul is used as a Christological title, except when there's an Old Testament quotation or allusion, does not stand up to the test that we have put it to. Now let me offer my own analysis of Paul's exegetical practice. First, it is noteworthy that Paul could preface both patrological, God-oriented, and Christological uses of Yahweh with an introductory formula, as it is written, for example. This clearly marks his intent to engage in explicit citation with either God or Christ in view. Second, the fluid nature of the manuscript tradition at the time of Paul is extremely, it makes it extremely difficult to determine whether a quotation is to be understood verbatim or is more of a loose quotation. It's therefore unwise to assume that quotations that are close to any known version are more likely to be patrological, referring to God. Third, whether Paul intends God or Christ as a referent has to be worked out through rigorous exegetical contextual analysis. What we find is that Paul reserves the name Yahweh, the Yahweh for Yahweh text for God mainly in theocentric passages. Let's go back and you'll see those. Notice in 4 and 9, 11 and 15 and in several places in 1 Corinthians. But usually there are themes involved. Usually there are reasons for that. And the, and the four that I want to point out is this. When Paul wants the reader to understand the Father rather than the Lord Jesus in one of these Yahweh texts, he states it clearly, either in the introductory formula or somewhere close in context, particularly under four themes, justification, divine wisdom, the fatherhood of God, and the relationship of Jew and Gentile. In those particular cases, he customarily uses a Yahweh text with God the Father as referent. Further, when there are other descriptive titles being used, such as Lord of Hosts or Lord Almighty, he retained the, retains these as patrologically directed. In contrast, he seldom offers a straightforward statement that he means to refer to Christ. I think this is because that for Paul, overwhelmingly, Kyrios is a Christological title. But he does apply Yahweh text to Christ in passages with a Christological focus under the following themes. The universality of the gospel, eschatological judgment and parousia, Christian ethics, as we talked about last night, divine wisdom as Christ crucified, the Lord's Supper, the role of the Spirit in the life of the believer, and finally in Paul's own apostolic authority. So what I want to do is turn my attention now to a couple of passages, dig down deep and show you what we're talking about. Here is Romans, or, or the key text, Romans 10 verse 13. And this is Paul's quotation in Romans 10 13, and this is the, what he's quoting. He's quoting Joel 2 32, which you'll find in the Septuagint is 3 verse 5. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, Kuryu, shall be saved. And then Joel, and it shall be. Notice the little slight difference there. And it shall be that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord, read Yahweh, read Kuryu, shall be saved. 
Well, what are we to make of this? Um, what's clear is that here, Kurios translates the divine name in Hebrew. In Joel, the promise of deliverance regards a remnant of Israel prior to the day of the Lord, if you go back and read it. And the phrase pas hasan, which is translated everyone, appears to suggest that even loyal diaspora Jews are going to be included in God's promise. Now Paul takes this as scriptural warrant for the inclusion of believing Gentiles along with faithful Jews. But Paul admits that Caius die and it shall be. He admits that from his quotation. Probably because for him the day has already arrived. For the prophet, it was still in the future. And the prophet says, and in one day it shall be. But for Paul, that day had already come. That day had already arrived. I think there are four reasons to see this as an Old Testament Yahweh text. One is the Christological focus of the entire passage. Now, Romans 9 through 11, if you look at Romans 9 through 11, you say, well, this is a very theocentric passage. But embedded within the middle of that, beginning in Romans 9.33 down to about 10.16, Christ begins to dominate. It's like Christ being embedded within God at that moment. And almost every scriptural quotation, beginning in 9.13, all the way. This is the part, by the way, where it says, and, and Christ is the telos of the law, right? Right before this. Christ is the telos, the end of the law, the, the goal, the, the purpose of the law. What Wright says, the climax of the covenant, right? Christ is that. And then later it says, who will ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down. And who will descend into the abyss? That is to raise Christ up from the dead. But, you know, the, the word that we preach, the word is near you. That's the word that we preach. And then he goes on uh, to, to cite that passage more fully about Christ and, and here. So we have a, clearly a Christological focus in this part of Romans. The resurrection emphasis there as well. And the eschatological interest, as we see, notice the future tense verb. We'll come back to see this. And it shall be, everyone who calls, shall be saved. So thesitai. So Thesitai, shall be saved. Talking about a future, not necessarily in the past. So Paul's quotation is this, for those who follow the Greek, pas, uh, pas gar hasan epi ta anima kuriu so Thesitai. The Septuagint version, kaias dai pas hasan epi kalesitai ta anima kuriu so Thesitai. Almost verbatim quotation now that Paul has related and connected to Christ. I think more than anything, probably the thing that uh, is that last one, the Christological confession, because Paul has just said, every, uh, if we confess with our mouths, Jesus is what? Lord. And believe in our hearts that God has raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. Same language now associated there with this. Here's that full, well, this is not the full passage. I, for some reason, I skipped over the full passage. This goes, takes us to the next version. Um, what's interesting is that language coming back, that language of calling upon the name of the Lord, what that means. In the Hebrew phrase, to call upon the name of the Lord, Kyrie Bashem Yahweh, involves cultic activity such as altar building and sacrifice and prayer and petitions and worship and praise. It distinguishes God's people as those who call upon His name. We are those who call upon the name of Yahweh and not like the other, other nations. Carl Davis describes this phrase as a religious act which characterized and even determined God's people. In his monograph, Davis traces this theological association of Joel 2.32 in pre-Christian and Jewish text. It concludes that the phrase is about cultic activity directed to Israel's one God, and there is ever, never any evidence it ever applies to another figure. Now, the only counter-evidence he cites is Josephus' War II, where Jews invoke the name of Caesar to liberate them from the tyranny of Florus. But the word is not epikaleo, but anakaleo. I think the language there matters. So Paul's use of the phrase, call upon the name of the Lord, in Romans 10, 13, is echoed in 1 Corinthians 1, 2, where Paul characterizes the universal church, the church everywhere, as those who call upon the name of the Lord Jesus. Same language, same verb, same name called there. Now, to this next passage. 
where, and here is the, uh, here's the full passage that I want to show you. For to this end, Christ died and lived again. Notice last night we talked about how the, the title Christ is usually associated with death, the death of Jesus, the sacrificial death of Jesus on the cross. To this end, Christ died and lived again. Now what I want to point out is that this is the only place where Paul refers to the resurrection as, quote, lived again. Right? He lived again. Notice the parallel. Christ died and lived again so he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. You see the parallel structure there. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Why do you uh, despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, and here's the text, oh, As I live, notice that word again, As I live, says the Lord, Every knee will bow to me, every tongue will give praise to God, so then each of us will give uh, then each of us will be accountable to God. Well, I want to explore a little bit this, these particular phrases and what they mean. As I live, says the Lord, to me will bow every knee and every tongue will confess to God. Isaiah, this is Isaiah 45.3. Notice we have a slightly different beginning. Isaiah 45, by myself I swear that to me will bow every knee and will confess every tongue to God. Isaiah 45, 23 provides the apostle with a remarkable image from which he fashioned certain convictions about Christ. The image, the bowing of every knee, and the confession of every tongue characterizes a strictly monotheistic interest in its concomitant a disdain for idolatry and any sort of polytheism. So in Romans 14, 11, Paul offers um, this particular passage his support for this belief. So in our passage, notice that oath formula has been changed out. What's immediately apparent is if we look here, as I live, says the Lord in Paul, and in Isaiah, by myself I swear, and it's Yahweh who's speaking, if we looked at the broader context. What's immediately apparent is we have two different oath formulas. So what's happening? Does this reflect the fluidity of biblical manuscripts available to Paul? So does he replace kat imautu amnuo, the second one, the one below, with the one on top, zo ego lege curios, as I live, says the Lord? Cranfield suggests the difference is due to Paul's faulty memory. For it's better, for it, the latter is more standard oath formula, as I live, says the Lord, is more standard. I would argue that Paul intends us to associate the Lord who lives, zo ego lege, as I live, says the Lord, in 1411, with the Lord who died and lived again, came back to life, so he might be Lord over the living and the dead. A stutargarth, Christos apethenin kai edzesin, he lived again, so he might be over the, the, over the dead and over the living, the one who is the Lord. Now, Paul there uses the verb form and not the noun form. This reading accounts for the very unusual fact that Paul uses edzesin, lived again, for the resurrection. Normally, it's anastasis or igero, but it's, he substituted one oath formula for another. Accordingly, the text should be read something like this, I think. As I live again by the resurrection, says the Lord Jesus, every knee will bow to me and every tongue will confess to God at the judgment seat. Notice how he bifurcates this, this quotation. He does the same thing here. The first line would refer to Jesus. As I live by the resurrection, says the Lord Jesus, every knee will bow to me, Jesus, and every tongue will give confession to God. This is the same thing that he does in places like at the beginning of the letters. Grace to you from God our Father, and peace, Lord Jesus Christ, right? And, and what he does with the Shema. For us, there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and to whom we, we go. And there is one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we are redeemed. Something to that effect. That, I think he's doing the same thing here with this quotation. The first part, he's directing toward Jesus. The second part, he's directing toward uh, God the Father particularly because it's the judgment seat place. This is a very unusual kind of thing that we find in Paul. Now, the same language is picked up in the Philippian hymn, the exact same language. Therefore, God exalted him and bestowed upon him the name above every name at the name of Jesus. Interesting. Is it the name Jesus? Right? Some debates about that. Jesus is the sweetest name I know, and it's just the same. Right? 
We sing about that. Is, is, is it the name Jesus? Or is it the name that belongs to Jesus? I would argue for the latter. And part of that is because I know a lot of Jesus is down in Houston. Right? Jesus is just, Jesus is just Joshua, basically. It's the name Joshua. It's a common name in that day. So, God has highly exalted Jesus. He's bestowed upon him the name which is above every name. Could that be Yahweh? At the name of Jesus, at the name that belongs to Jesus, when that is spoken, every knee will bow of those in heaven and earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Kyrios, Lord, to the glory of God the Father, or for the glory of God the Father, depending upon your translation. Well, I want you to see the place from which this is taken. Just a couple of slides here, very quickly. For thus says the Lord, Yahweh, Kyrios, who created the heavens, He is God, who formed the earth and made it, He established it, He did not create it in chaos, but formed it to be inhabited. I am Yahweh, and there is no other. This is a common refrain in Isaiah 45. It is the most stridently monotheistic passage in all the Hebrew Bible. I am Yahweh, and there is no other. Here's another passage, same context. Declare and present your case. Let them take counsel together. Who told this long ago? Who declared it of old? Was it not I, Yahweh? There is no other God beside me. A righteous God and Savior. There is no one besides me. And finally, a little closer to our passage. Turn to me and be saved, he says, all the ends of the earth. For I am God and there is no other. By myself I have sworn, from my mouth has gone forth in righteousness a word that shall not return to me. Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. Now there are some different words here and there, but by and large what we have clearly is a, almost a verbatim quotation from the Greek text of the Septuagint, now applied to Jesus in this particular language. Larry Kreitzer makes this statement, it's a good one. It's difficult to imagine any first century Jew remotely familiar with Isaiah 45, hearing this stanza of Philippians 2 without recognizing that words of theistic import have now been applied to Christ. And I think that's probably sound judgment. Well, these are just a couple of examples. Um, I, I wish we could look at each one of them. and I, I, Our time doesn't, doesn't quite allow it. But let me uh, kind of move on to something else now as we kind of bring this together. Clearly what Paul is doing, both in the thematic and in the text by text by text, he's including Jesus somehow within the name and the very dignity of God. And I think, well, any good theory has got to be able to explain other stuff, right? I mean, if that's true, if Paul is including Jesus that way, can that help explain some other things Paul is doing? Well, I think it does. It helps explain why, if that's true, and if that's how Paul sees things, that Jesus is included somehow in the name and the dignity of God, that that is why I think prayers and worship and hymns could be addressed to Jesus. It makes perfect sense. That's why they gave the words of Jesus authoritative status. They looked at his example and they ordered their lives around it. They looked at, at, his, at his teaching and they ordered their lives around it. He became the basis of their ethics, their new ethics. This is why Jesus is claimed to be pre-existent as an agent of creation and as one who is the coming, the coming judge. So it seems to me that, that a lot of st there's a lot of stuff going on here in Paul's use of this particular language and associated with Jesus. Larry Hurtado uses the language, the binatarian shape of early Christian devotion. And I think that's probably a good one because we do not see necessarily early at this point spirit treated in quite the same way. We have language that is evocative, language that is, I think, carefully crafted, connections that are made sometimes, but uh, more often than not, we see Jesus and the Father, Jesus the Lord and God the Father linked together in this particular way. Now, Hurtado says the reason this is all happening in a monotheistic connection is because of the divine agency concept where God had had um, agents and, and some of those agents acted uh, in God's place and acted in God's, God's name. And, and these agents would include uh, d uh, patriarchs, exalted patriarchs from the past who had sort of come back. These agents would include divine angels, angels like Michael, uh, Gabriel, Yahweh, other na named angels. And then also divine attributes like wisdom 
perhaps, and logos, those kinds of things we see coming back. Now, um, Richard Baucom is, is one. I think we're doing okay time-wise. Richard Baucom is another that I'd like to highlight because we've talked a little bit about Hurtado. But let me, uh, a little bit about Richard Baucom's work in his book, God Crucified, and uh, may, may, I guess first, God Crucified, which is a terrific little book. I think Richard Baucom offers a promising proposal for understanding the relationship between Jewish monotheism and early Christianity, early Christology. Baucom argues that this high Christology expressed in what I'm trying to argue here in the New Testament does not find its antecedent in the semi-divine intermediary figures. Again, he's sort of contradicting Hurtado at that moment. But rather, he proposes this, and this is the language that he uses. The early Christians included Jesus precisely and unambiguously within the unique identity of the one God of Israel. For Baucom to understand the interplay between Jewish monotheism and early Christian sort of claims about Jesus as divine, you must understand, quote, the identity of God as it was understood in Second Temple Judaism. Earlier discussions about Christology have suffered because they said, well, this is a functional Christology or this is an ontic Christology. And they, these kind of categories, he felt, were misleading and ambiguous. And I think he's right. Divine identity holds, he says, better a grasp of the evidence that's found in contemporary literature. As with human identity, divine identity regards who God is, God as a person, God who acts, God who speaks, God who is known, and God who knows. Identity distinguishes God from everything that is not God. Baucom discusses two categories, two features, relevant to Second Temple Jewish thought. God in his relationship to Israel, a very key point, but also God in relationship to creation, all the rest of reality. For Israel, God reveals himself as a covenant partner, making himself known through all these acts in history, like the Exodus, for example. For the rest of reality, God relates as a creator, a ruler, and ultimately judge of all things. Ultimately, God alone is responsible for creating and governing the world. Though he does use the myriads of angels, apparently, to help him execute his purposes. But they never, uh, they never get confused with God, do they? Bauckham focuses on the character of early Jewish monotheism. Against those who think that the lines of distinction between God and certain divine mediator figures were blurred, Bauckham argues that the Second Temple Judaism is strictly monotheistic. Indeed, there's strong evidence to suggest that Jews draw hard lines of distinction between God and everything that's not God. Not exactly a chasm, but it could be described that way. In particular, the idea that God has a principal angel like Michael or Yahweh, the angel of the Lord, as a second in command is not commonplace. It's fairly rare in the literature. Angels do serve God's purposes, but they never sit on the throne. And they flatly refuse it when people try to worship them. The only uh, exception, according to Bauckham, is the Son of Man figure in the book of First Enoch. But there's problems. Is, it, is, is that early enough to be useful data? On the other hand, he says personified attributes such as word and wisdom do participate in God's creation. Do administer the cosmos and should be recognized as perhaps intrinsic to the unique divine identity. Whether these aspects should be understood as literary devices, just ways of speaking about God, or you know, distinct beings separate from God, he leaves that question unsettled, and probably we should to here. Now, Bauckham assesses the evidence regarding writers uh, who include Jesus within the identity of God, like Paul has done, they acknowledge him as creator and sovereign Lord. They view him as bearing the divine name. Without hesitation, they worship him. In fact, according to Bauckham, this fully divine Christology characterizes the early church before the New Testament, even first document of the New Testament appears. Whether that's 1 Thessalonians or Galatians is sometimes debated. Although this, and what he calls this Christological monotheism, is an innovation, it is continuous with Jewish monotheism properly understood and does not require a setting somewhere else in the community where belief in God's oneness has either eroded or been repudiated as a monotheistic faith. 
The very nature of Jewish belief allows this development. For Bauckham, the catalyst for this innovation emerges in scriptural exegesis. He thinks that Christian theology develops through a creative reading of biblical text. And early Christians mine every resource available in the scriptures to sculpt the theology that includes Jesus within the divine identity. Specifically, Bauckham looks at places like Psalm 110.1. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your footstool. Places like that. In 1 Corinthians 8.6, Paul's reworked Shema. The apostle continues to consider himself a monotheist. And so the confession, one God the Father, one Lord Jesus Christ, is not ditheistic and should not be understood remotely in those categories. Paul Bauckham finds divine identity the most satisfying category to understand how Jesus' followers could include him in this identity of God. Then we have N.T. Wright. For, for N.T. Wright... Early Christology was not some modification of a pre-existing belief in a divine mediator figure. Again, contra Hurtado. He gets beat up a lot, I think. It was instead a robust concretizing of hopes concentrated in the one true God and his promise to one, return one day to Zion. If it is evident that early Christians referred Yahweh text to Jesus, as I've tried to argue, and engaged in worship of him in ways in which it was only thought appropriate at one time to God, why should we not begin with God and not some other exalted agents? He asks, were there stories, hopes, ambitions within Second Temple Judaism which early Christians could have drawn from in order to say what they wanted to say about Jesus? Indeed, he says there were. According to Wright, central to Second Temple Judaism was the belief that Israel's one God having one time abandoned Jerusalem and the temple prior to its destruction in the 6th century uh, B.C., had promised one day to return to his people. That return would be in person and in glory. That return would be to judge and to save, specifically to bring a new exodus, overthrowing Israel's uh, enemies and releasing them from bondage. In short, God would return to be king. In Wright's own words, the long-awaited return of Yahweh to Zion is the origin of Christology. Interesting idea. Israel's God promised to return, and return he did in the person of Jesus, the Messiah. Before Paul wrote a single letter, the first followers of Jesus found themselves not only permitted to use God language for Jesus, but compelled to use Jesus language to talk about God. Paul's version of this conviction may not be quite as clear as what Paul, uh, John says, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and the Word was God, etc. But there is ample evidence from Paul's letters to conclude that Israel's God was fully and personally present in and as Jesus the Messiah. About 70 years ago, a scholar named A.R. Johnson wrote a book called The One and the Many in the Israelite Conception of God. Johnson considers the Hebrew concept of the human the best analog for thinking about God, right? theology from below. He begins with the observation that the Israelites conceive of humans as possessing a kind of indefinable extension of their personality. The notion of personality becomes the basis for attributing to God similar extensions of personality, for example, spirit, wisdom, word, etc., Johnson concludes that within a monotheistic framework, the Israelites envisaged their one God as having multiple manifestations. And he goes on to suggest some possible Christological applications. What I find interesting is that Bauckham and Wright and this other scholar, right, A.R. Johnson, that they are actually doing somewhat the same thing. They have similar theories, but under different language. Divine identity, return to Zion theology are just different ways to talk about the same reality. Their similarities could be coincidental, I suppose, but it's nevertheless the fact that Johnson and Wright and Balk are working independently, yet arrive at similar conclusions, speaks to the truth or maybe the strength of their arguments. So let me uh, see if I can sum up here. To, uh, to wind this thing up, 
Paul deliberately and very unambiguously applies to Jesus' Old Testament text and the themes related to the unspeakable name of God, the divine name, the Yod, the He, the Vav, the He. Along with other patterns of religious devotion, this means that he identifies Jesus with God. Or to import Bauckham's language, he includes Jesus within the unique identity of Israel's God. Yet, he continues to see Christ as distinct and subordinate to the Father. This high Christology is apparent in the earliest extant documents of the Christian movement. At the same time, Paul is a Jew. He's a monotheist, cut from the same cloth as Joel and Isaiah. He wants to maintain the oneness of God over against this notion that polytheists and idolaters have that the world is populated with multiple, lots of gods. Nevertheless, he desires to give Jesus the highest honor, the highest rank, the highest reverence any monotheist ever gave the one God of Israel. The title Kurios provided, provided Paul with the particular language and sets of associations that he needed to make the bold claim that the risen Jesus, about the risen Jesus and his significance among the new people of God. In particular, his use of all Yahweh text represents an astounding appropriation of scriptural language to express Paul's devotion to Christ. It should not be underestimated. And I conclude here. This is an audacious claim that Paul is making. If it is untrue, if it's a fiction, if it's just made up, then it certainly would be scandalous. Thanks very much for your time. I'm interested in your questions. Well, thank you very much indeed. Fascinating thank, thank and you. interesting lecture. I'd like to open it up now to the audience for questions. The ones going over there with a the microphone. Thanks very much, Dr. Capes. Uh, thank you. I was just uh, thinking about um, this odd question just kind of popped into my head I was, as I was thinking about what you were saying. And, uh, I was I'll just have an odd answer for you then, okay. if, that's, if that's okay. Uh, but I'm, that's fine with me. <laughs> um, are you aware of any uh, Latin American or African or Asian scholars that are engaging in this kind of thinking? Yeah, you know, I, I've, I've, had, um, I've had people write me some scholars from other countries, and Africa comes to mind. I'm not sure Latin American, um, but yeah, favorably, sort of, uh, it, writing about it favorably, yes. But not Latin American. I don't know well, why, uh, necessarily. Uh, so a lot of African folks go to the Europe, and I think probably some of the work that I've done is a bit better known over there. And um, so that could, be, that could be the reason for that. Yeah, is there, do you have any kind of thoughts about, about that, or positive or negative, or? No, I think it's a great question on, uh, I, I took a course uh, a few years ago with uh, Dan Maria. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and he said, he challenged us to start looking globally uh, toward scholars and not hmm. be so... Uh, Eurocentric, <laughs> right, yeah. right, West, West, yeah. 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 Sure. Yeah, I'd be. I'd be certainly. Uh, I've met Rene Padilla. I, I don't know him, but I've met him and uh, I've had a little. Con in fact, uh, he he sort of offhandedly helped us a little bit with our translation of the Voice. He didn't know it yet, but uh, we're not going to give him any royalties or anything. But um, he, he some suggestions he made about the phrase "de sine tu theu," the righteousness of God. We we picked up on and we elaborated on that a little bit, but yeah. So I, I would certainly be glad to be in dialogue or discussion, positively or negatively, with folks from that part of the world. Yeah, thank you. As I've uh, enjoyed your lectures these days, um, thank you. I'm reflecting on my rereading of A Faith for This One World by Leslie Newbigin. Mm. And he uses uh, words to describe Jesus in his discussions as the absolute, for example, hmm. which causes me to think in terms of what I'm hearing from the scriptures is an attempt to express the uniqueness of Jesus in their culture, 
and in their terms. Yeah. Can you yeah. think of any terms that we might use today in our uh, secular, scientific, technological day that could express that uniqueness of Jesus uh, to modern mankind, such as I think Bishop Newbigin was seeking to do mm -hmm. in his book. Well, you know, the, for us, the language of Lord, using that particular language, is comes with a little baggage, I suppose. Um, and 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 um, it, it is it is a tradition that we've inherited, though. I'm not sure what uh, before the King James Bible and and some of the tr translations, King James, the Geneva Bible, and some of the earlier ones. Um, what kind of language they used, how they, how they employed that. Um, but I think we're probably heirs of that today, so that when, when we use the word Lord, we might be a little uncomfortable with the kind of hierarchy that that implied with lords and ladies and serfs and people of different levels. But that's sort of the world it came out of, at least our Bible tradition does. I'd have to think long and hard about what new language, because almost everything we would choose, we said the absolute, that sounds a bit philosophical. Is that more available to people today? Does that say more? Is that more true? Um, but I'd be I'd be interested in sort of hearing from you about that. Um, I don't know that I have any other language available to me at this particular point. Um, Just the the challenge to speak to modern yes, man, yes, who yes. doesn't have a biblical background. Yeah, to express in modern language the uniqueness of Christ, as, as certainly Paul was wrestling with in his context, right. seems to me to be very important, perhaps especially for missionary work. Yes, yeah, I think so. In, in the voice translation, when in the the Hebrew Bible part, uh, when we came to the divine name, we translated that the eternal, because we were trying to get at the meaning behind the name, the I am that I am. The yod the hey the vav the hey the uh, and 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 to some degree the whole story of who God is the one who was the one who is the one who is to come so we use that particular language in the in the Old Testament but we retain the word Lord for translation the word Adonai for example in the New Testament we we just retain the term Lord um, I'd I'd be yeah I'd be thrilled to sort of rethink that at some point and Thomas Nelson is, would be interested. I think, in, in, in updating the translation as time goes on. But what language? Does anybody have any thoughts or ideas about it? I think there was a question from the gentleman next to him. Yeah, he as well. This is a different question. Yeah. Um, this is exciting um, stuff that you, you lectured on. I'm really excited about it. I'm wondering how come <laughs> more Jews are not convinced after this language, uh, this exception, it's, 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 so yeah. it's bold-faced. It's bold and it's also blasphemous. Uh, that's why I said it's a scandal. I could use the word, if, if the link, if this were a fiction, if this were not true, would be blasphemy. And that's why Jesus, obviously, in the Jewish context, that he's accused of blasphemy, isn't he? In, in the trial before the San, Sanhedrin for, uh, for these sort of claims. Now, you know, scholars debate all these things, but uh, there's, there's a question, you know, it, to say this, what does this mean? And to link, uh, I mean, I, I can just hear my rabbi friend right now, my best friend's a rabbi, I can just hear his rejoinder to that. First of all, he shrinks back whenever anybody tries to pronounce the divine name, because he says, we can't know how it was pronounced. He doesn't think it was pronounced like I've done it the last three days, Yahweh, he thinks it was pronounced differently. And then t to mispronounce God's name, over and over again, it is an insult to the one true God. So you've got to get it right. We can't get it right, so we don't even try. But to link Jesus in this way with God so closely, so powerfully, to say that the things that the scriptures that we're talking about really could be, uh, really have Jesus as part of that, now, in, in Paul's way of thinking, would be considered blasphemy. And so... This kind of thing, we've got to be careful with it. And uh, the claim that Jesus is the Messiah is not necessarily blasphemy. They would just say he's wrong. He failed. 
He didn't accomplish any of the messianic, true messianic task. So everything that Christians confess, there's a response to. And so th this, this would not carry much weight, this kind of discussion. And of course, Paul's an apostate anyway. Well, listen to him. He's about as relevant, uh, Paul is as relevant to Judaism as Buddha is to Christianity. So do we, do we listen to Buddha? No. Do we listen to Muhammad? No. So Paul, the Jews, totally irrelevant. Totally apostate. We don't. David Koresh, you know, he's a David Koresh kind of guy. For those of you who don't remember David Koresh, 1993 in the States, in Waco, Texas. Uh, Waco, Waco, Texas. Uh, but yeah, they, they would completely deny. They might say, well, this is, might be an accurate reading of Paul, but Paul was an apostate, so why would we listen to him? He has nothing to say to Jews and Judaism. You know, Dr. Um, Capes, I'm really excited to hear that you're thinking, you're alluding to doing more studies about the um, Yahweh text mm. and its association, association with the word Lord. Mm. Um, yeah, I really would love to read more about this, know more, because... Um, I'm well, hopefully there'll be a book. We'll get the book. Yeah, because <laughs> about I'm a so year disappointed in the Hindi Bible... Uh, in, mm. in, in, unfortunately, um, almost all the references to God is Yehovah instead of, which I think, I, I don't know Hebrew, um, I'm not an expert at Hebrew, right. but I think a more appropriate word would be, would be Lord. And, um, yeah, I, I talked a little bit about that on, on Monday, um, the, sort of the different ways that the word Lord has been, and Jehovah uh, is, is certainly one of those that, it becomes an amalgamated kind of word, made up word to some degree. But effectively, in the English speaking world, it becomes the name of God for a long time. I don't think too many people still look at Jehovah's Witnesses, do, obviously, and some others. But uh, yeah, I think it's, it's, no one does that anymore, at least in the English speaking world. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I was just wondering what's the most challenging objection that you've heard? to your works that you've encountered so far? I've convinced a lot of people, at least, uh, wh where I have pushback is a particular text. If I say, well, this, I argue that this particular text, and someone like Gordon Feast is not convinced, you know. He, he's convinced generally of the theory and the thesis that I'm driving, but, but he might not grant that this is really a Christological appropriation on this particular text. But broadly speaking, he would agree. And uh, I guess the biggest pushback I've gotten has been from people like Jimmy Dunn that feel like I have not taken seriously enough the subordination language in Paul. And I understand that. But, uh, you, you know, you, I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do that. I'm trying to, I'm trying to take that seriously. But at the end of the day, I can't help but come to certain conclusions about this amazing use of language and scripture and divine name and associating with Jesus. That's got to mean something pretty powerful. Even at the end of the day, there is still God the Father, Lord Jesus Christ, in a subordinated kind of relationship. I do talk about that. I do write about that. But I probably need to rethink some of that and maybe re-nuance some things. Thanks, though. Yeah. And I think we have time for another question. Over there to my left. Thanks. Good questions. Thank you. All, all three days. Thank you so much. Hi there. Uh, I hesitate to ask a question because I missed the last two nights, so thanks for having me tonight. Sure, glad um, you're here. I'm, I'm curious about the space that the scribes would leave for uh, the four-letter word, um, four-letter name, the divine name. Now, was the intention for someone else to write that? Like, did, did they create the space so that someone else would write it in? And if so, who was that other person and why were they writing it in? Yeah, uh, Dr. Evans may have thought on that, but I do think it's meant, uh, as they're writing it through the first time, they leave the space for someone else to come back. Now, we don't know who that someone else is. I don't know that I have any sort of first century, second century evidence for that. It could be the same scribe who just wanted to exercise real care in sort of writing over and over the same names and not misspelling. Notice about the erasures. Once the name is written, you don't blot it out. You don't erase it. Bad idea. Um, so, it, but it could well be another scholar who comes back, another color of ink. I, I don't. I haven't looked at the ink, 
but it seems like you could look at the ink and say, okay, this is a little bit different quality ink. It clearly isn't the same ink as we went the first time through. You'd have to look at, I think, at case by case. Dr. What, Dr. Evans, do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, we do speculate about that. Different ink, uh, uh, it's not just a different color, a different uh, recipe, maybe thought of as higher quality, mm. and a uh, different quill, segregation, you know, specialization, things like that. Yeah. But, you know, given the evidence that we have and how old it is and the condition it's in, it's a little bit speculative. Yeah, yeah, I don't think we can, we can't pound the pulpit on that one and say, thus says the Lord. Um, I think what we can do is make, make good judgments and conjectures based upon the physical evidence that's there in front of us. But uh, it's kind of remarkable. It's interesting, too, I didn't show you an example, but um, even, uh, you have the name Yahweh, yod which is written sometimes in Paleo-Hebrew, but even the prepositions that are attached like le Yahweh or buh Yahweh, those, those are sometimes, because they're, they're attached to the divine name, are written also in Paleo-Hebrew. So now it's not always that way, but it, there's, there's a variety in which that, that does happen. So the prepositions that are pre, prepositioned and attached to the word uh, are, are often treated with that same reverence, just simply because they're attached to the name, right? So I hope that helps a little bit. Indeed. Uh, Thanks so much for these uh, three three last things. <laughs>